Good morning, friends, and welcome to Christ Church Parish. We're so glad that you're taking some time to be with us in worship and in prayer. Back in March, when the bishop came for his visitation, he brought with him holy oil that he had blessed, that we use at every baptism. This oil is olive oil, but it's been prayed over, and that olive oil is then spread on the heads of all the newly baptized. Today, we'll think about the anointing that we have received and reflect on the ways in which Jesus and David and Saul and Samuel and all who've gone before were anointed by God's oil in the sign of the Holy Spirit. Now be with us in prayer and in worship and prepare to sing with us the first hymn. Our opening hymn is number 450, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, verses 1, 2, 3, and 6. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. 
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Keep, O Lord, your household, the church, in your steadfast faith and love, that through your grace we may proclaim your truth with boldness and minister your justice with compassion for the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now let us be attentive as we hear God's word. A reading from the first book of Samuel. Samuel went to Rahama, and Saul went up to his house in Gilead of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord, sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel, the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for you myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sacrificed Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Elab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of the statue, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They took on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinad and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in reading Psalm 20 responsively by verse, as found in your bulletin. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend you. Send you Send help you from his holy place, place and, and strengthen, strengthen you out of Zion. Remember all your offerings and accept your burnt off sacrifice. Grant you your heart's desire and, and prosper, prosper all your plans. We will shout for joy at your victory and triumph in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. 
Now I know that the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He will answer him out of his holy heaven with the victorious strength of his right hand. Some put their trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will call upon the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall down, but we will arise and stand upright. O oh Lord, give victory to the king and answer us when we call. A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. We are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yea, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we made it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each may receive recompense for what has been done to our body, whether good or evil, for the love of Christ urges us on, because we are convinced that once has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who have might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view, even though we have once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise day and night, and the seed would sprout and grow, he does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with the sickle, because the harvest has come. Jesus also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth, Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. And he did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. speak to you in the name of our loving, liberating, life-giving God. Amen. Sixty-eight years ago last week, Elizabeth II entered Westminster Abbey and took an oath and was anointed with holy oil, invested with robes and royal regalia, crowned as Queen of the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Pakistan, and Ceylon, which we now call Sri Lanka. It's a one of those details that's a little bit lost in the midst of all the coronation ceremonies is the anointing of a king or a queen. But anointing is significant to us, and today as we look at the passage from 1 Samuel, we see that anointing plays a crucial role in determining who is blessed by the Lord for leadership of God's people. 
If you recall last week, we had the struggle over whether or not to have a king, Samuel and God being in the no king side, the people saying, no, we need a king like all the other nations have. But Samuel does go and anoint Saul. And in the passages which go from chapter 8, where we were last week, to chapter 15, where we were today, we hear the bumpy ride that is the reign of Saul over God's people. As God's anointed one, anointed by Samuel, Saul has some early successes, but he wants to do it his own way. And when God gives specific instructions about specific battles and the way to fight them, Saul begins to ignore them. And so its passage begins today. God has given up on Saul. Whatever anointing and oil Saul received, God has pulled away the support of the Spirit for his work. And Samuel sees this and is grieved. The Lord says, how long will you grieve over Saul? For I've rejected him as being king. Fill your horn with oil, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I provided myself a king from among his sons two important things that we should hear in this. He's going to be anointing a new king. There's going to be power poured out upon a new king for the people, and they're going to Bethlehem to find the king. Do you hear that echo? They're going to Bethlehem to find a king. Bethlehem would become a place where two kings would come from. Jesus, born in Bethlehem, and the new king that's about to be anointed. And so it is that when we read 1 Samuel, we hear echoes that will go all the way down to Jesus' time. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Saul says, Samuel says, how can I go? If I go anointing someone, it's going to be an act of treason. You see, because we already have a king, and to anoint someone else a king, well, Saul will kill me, he says. And the Lord says, well, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. Now, Jesse is one of the pr prominent leaders of Bethlehem. He's part of that tribe. And so it is that he finds himself with Samuel, the great prophet, coming to him. And nobody in town wants to see Samuel coming. They know that already Saul is in trouble, and now the man who anointed Saul is coming to town, and they're frightened and say, oh, do you come peaceably? And Samuel says, I have come peacefully. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And so Jesse and his sons all get around. This is an interesting kind of sacrifice. This is one where the heifer is sacrificed and offered to God, but, but the barbecue ribs and the, and the beef brisket, those are all for the people to eat. So it's a wonderful feast in, dis, in addition to offering a sacrifice to God. And Jesse lines his sons up. And when they came, Samuel looked at the first, Eliab, and says, surely the anointed of the Lord is now before me. And God says, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. God had already chosen Saul, who was handsome and a foot taller than everybody else, but Saul hadn't done so well. So Eliab is certainly not going to go any further forward than Saul did. For it says, the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So Jesse decides if Eliab isn't it, then it's time for Abinadab. And Abinadab comes, and God says, nope, not that one either. And Shammah, he comes by. Neither has the Lord chosen that one. The Lord is sort of whispering into Samuel's ear. And all seven of the sons that are there walk before Samuel, and God says, nope, 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 nope. And the Lord has not chosen any of these. So Samuel says to Jesse, is this all the sons you have? I mean, seven would be a good number, like seven days of the week. Seven would be a good number, like a whole number and completion. But Jesse allows there's one more. He's out in the field looking after the sheep. He remains nameless. In fact, I've worked really hard in this sermon not to name him because that's the way the storyteller leads us on in this. Seven sons pass by, and now Samuel says, we will not eat. The brisket is going to go cold while we are waiting until this other child comes in. So Jesse sends and brings him in, and he's ruddy, and he has beautiful eyes, and he's handsome. 
Scholars go back and forth on whether he's ruddy because he's been out in the fields and he has a lovely tan, or whether he's a redhead, whatever it is, he is truly someone who shows off this power within him. And the Lord says, rise and anoint him, for he is the one. So Samuel takes his horn of oil and anoints him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord comes mightily upon David. You knew it was coming. David is anointed. Now, David is probably 18, maybe 20, maybe 16. He's a kid. Saul has already had this long career fighting battles and leading wars. And David is anointed. And, and from this day forward, David would be the anointed one with the Spirit of God upon him. He's anointed, but he's not yet crowned. During this last week, I came upon an amazing article by a man named Tim Safford, S-A-F-F-O-R-D. Tim Safford writes for the, the uh, Christian Century. He writes brilliant articles, and he really brought me to see this passage in a new way as he speaks of the way in which David is anointed but not crowned. You see, it's going to be some time before Saul finishes out his life and his career. In fact, David refers to Saul throughout the rest of the first Samuel. Saul is, is God's anointed. When David has an opportunity to kill his rival Saul, who mistreats him terribly, he doesn't do it because he cannot bring himself to kill the Lord's anointed. But David himself carries the Spirit of God. He's been anointed with oil. He's been dedicated for a particular purpose much in the way that we might dedicate a room as a quiet place for reading or dedicate a phone line for our international phone calls. Priests are anointed and the altar is anointed and the bowls used in the tabernacle were anointed and other utensils, they are special. They are set aside for something supremely important. Beginning in 1 Samuel, kings are anointed ones. They are the ones who are dedicated to an extraordinary work, just as Elizabeth II was dedicated 68 years ago this week to be the queen of England and all the dependencies. Deep in the background of all this is God's disappointment at Israel's leadership. Samuel had anointed Saul, and Saul disappointed. Saul didn't do the things that God asked him to do. And so it is that David is chosen, and he begins to follow in God's way. And David will become the name that we know. The sons of David, the son of David, whom is one of the titles that Jesus is called. It reminds us of the central fact that David managed to bring people together in a way that Saul seems only to have driven them apart. In the years to come, Saul will make David's life a misery. He's threatened, attacked, forced to run for his life. David lives in the wilderness with a collection of misfits. He may even have done the treason of working with the Philistines against Saul. And so we have one of the strangest interludes in the Bible. God's chosen, the king of Israel, has to run from God's rejected king. The chosen king does nothing to exert his dignity or right. He merely tries to stay alive. Tim Safford asks, how long did the powerlessness go? We can only guess. He might have been 16 or 21, young enough to be dismissed as insignificant. We know that David was 30 when he was finally king, crowned king of Judah and 37 when he was crowned king over all of Israel. Perhaps he lived as anointed but not crowned for as many as eight or 10 years. Think of Prince Charles, who's been waiting for his mother to pass on so that he could attain the reign. He's been quite a patient man. There's a period in the United States we know between the election of a president and his inauguration. This transition time is filled with preparation. For David, transition went on for years, not just a few months. And David made no preparations to take charge. And so that brings us to the son of David that we know. It's not that long ago, back in, in January, when we celebrated the feast of the baptism of Christ. At the baptism of Christ, the heavens open and the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus. And God says, this is my child, the beloved, in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is anointed at his baptism. And the power that he receives makes him son of David, son of man, the leader who will bring us forward. We're used to saying Jesus Christ. Christ is a Greek word. It's a translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. 
The Hebrew word Messiah is a translation of the word that I've been using all along, anointed one. Jesus is an anointed one in the same way that David is. Jesus has received God's spirit and God's power, and we know right well that Jesus did not receive the kind of crown that we might hope for. In fact, the only crown that Jesus has offered during his lifetime is a crown of thorns as he's being tortured before his execution. But Paul understands Jesus' suffering as being a new kind of crown. In, second, in the second chapter of Philippians, Paul writes, Therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus, Messiah, is Lord, the glory of God the Father. You see, Jesus has been now crowned. By his death and resurrection, Jesus has taken on all the authority that God wants to give. Jesus becomes the pinnacle, having been anointed, done his work, and then been crowned. But when Tim Safford started this, I thought, well, that's all really sweet. And then I got to the last page where Tim does something that I didn't expect at all. You know that we anoint people when we baptize them. You were sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Every person I have ever baptized, I've taken that oil, blessed by my bishop as a sign of the universal church, to say, this person is anointed, given the Holy Spirit, given the gift. You are anointed people, and you will receive a crown. Near the end of his life, Paul writes to Timothy, now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Or in Revelation, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give your life as a victor's crown. See, the reason we read 1 Samuel is to understand what anointing is about. Anointing is about the giving of God's power to people so that they may do God's work. Saul received the anointing, but he didn't do God's work. David received the anointing. He had to wait eight years before he received the crown. Jesus received God's anointing, but it was not only after his death and resurrection that he was crowned with a name above all names. Friends, you have received that anointing. You, like David and Jesus, and Mary and Martha and all the saints who have followed along have been anointed with power by the Holy Spirit. You are the church and you have the mission that's before you. And in the end, friends, the promise is made that we will receive a crown. Not a crown to strut around in, but a crown that acknowledges that we have done the work. Not a crown to show off to everybody how rich we are, but a crown that shows we are made rich by following God's way God's word. David did just that. And the storyteller of 1 Samuel builds us up that moment when we see this one who is ruddy and handsome. And God says, this is the one. Today, God looks on you in love, remembering that you are part of the baptized. And as part of the baptized, God goes into the closet and buffs up the crown that you will one day wear. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, having stood the test, for that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him, says James. Let us aim for our crown so that we might shine with God's glory. Amen. And we share with those in every generation, professing the faith of the church as we say, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of the Father. 
he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end we believe in the holy spirit the lord the giver of life who proceeds from the father and the son with the father and the son he is worshiped and glorified he has spoken through the prophets we believe in one holy catholic and apostolic church we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins we look to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come amen and now with open hearts and open eyes let us pray for the church and for the world with the prayers of the people let us pray for the church and for the world grant almighty god that all who confess your name may be united in your truth live together in your love and reveal your glory in the world lord in your mercy hear our prayer guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace that we may honor one another and serve the common good lord in your mercy hear our prayer give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all those whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that you, we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And as leaders in Europe and the United States gather to talk about the future of the world, we pray the prayer attributed to St. Francis. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Share a sign of peace with those around you and hold in your hearts those that you cannot see today. Peace. Peace. And we prepare the table for the sacrifice that we offer to God, remembering Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. This is a place where we bring our life and our labors to God, and I invite you to prepare your hearts. My friends, you have been anointed at your baptism with the Holy Spirit 
and crowned with the crown that you will receive when you enter into heaven. I invite you as ministers of the gospel to come before this table with your cares and your concerns, your hurts and your sorrows, but also come with your joys and the desire to serve God in the ministry to which God calls you. This is the Lord's table and all who wish to receive are welcome. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling Christ's death and resurrection and ascension, we offer to you these gifts. Sanctify them to be by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. At the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, using the prayer, the contemporary form of the Lord's Prayer, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. The gifts of God. For the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Body of Christ, bread of heaven. Body of Christ, bread of heaven. Body of Christ, bread of heaven. May Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, 
You have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Our closing hymn is number 424, For the Fruit of All Creation. Well, friends, you've made it to the end of another video. We're so grateful that you hang in here so that you can find out what's going on. Our sisters and brothers over at Camp Wright are beginning their summer season. The counselors are here and the campers are arriving. I'd ask that you remember them in your prayers. They'll be dealing with children who have been inside for a very long time. We're going to show them the great God's world around them. So pray for counselors and campers. Pray for Julia and Caitlin and Kara and all the leadership that makes Camp Right a wonderful place. Our small group discussions have begun, and we have two more weeks worth of Zooms, in-person at church, and in-person at home discussions. We want to know what you have learned in this last year, what your thoughts about the church going forward are, so that we can begin to figure out what God has in mind for all of us. You carry one seed of the many seeds that will make God's garden grow here on Kent Island. So please sign up. You can go to the parish website or call the office and we'll make sure that we can find a place whether you want to be distanced on Zoom face-to-face -face here at the church or at somebody's house where you can sit and tell stories about the last 15 months and about our hope for the 15 months to come. This coming Saturday, we'll be at Broad Creek Cemetery. That place has been holy ground since 1652, and we will gather to remember those names that we know who were interred there in, the, in that beautiful place. So I invite you to come and be a part of it at one o'clock, whether you have a loved one buried there or not. It's a holy site, and it's a chance for us to do some ancient prayers together. So join us at one o'clock on the 19th at Broad Creek Cemetery. Deacon Melody had some back surgery this last week. 
I hope by now, when you're watching this, she's home from the hospital. A card to Deacon Melody would mean so much. If you call, she's got to answer the phone. If she's not feeling well, she has to let it go to voicemail. But a card is something she can pick up and care for. She has cared for this parish for more than 20 years. And it's important that we take a stand alongside of Deacon Melody as she recovers. Also a reminder about prayer, if you would like to have prayer said for you, for your family, for an event that's coming up, a birth of a baby, or perhaps your own surgery, you can send an email to prayer at ccpki.org, Christchurch Parish, Kent Island, org. Send an email to prayer. I will respond as quickly as I can. I'll add you to my daily prayers Monday to Thursday at 5 p.m. for evening prayer and hold us, hold you in our hearts as the days and weeks and months go forward. I'm here in the, uh, in the food pantry to remind you that we're continuing to feed children in the backpacks program. It shifts a little bit. It's a little different emphasis in the summertime, but there are still hungry people in our neighborhoods. Remember our sisters and brothers in Graysonville as well. If you see something on sale, buy a bunch of it and bring it by, and we'll make sure that the people who need it get it. Lastly, if you haven't gotten anything from soup and salad lately, go on the parish website, look for the soup and salad thing, click the button, get on the email list, and eat some of the delicious things that come along. This last week was chicken salad, so I think that means shrimp salad's coming up next week. And there are all kinds of wonderful soups, including a gazpacho that will nourish you and keep you going. So don't forget and share it with your neighbors so that they know that we are a parish that feeds ourselves and we feed our community. May our loving, liberating, and life-giving God bless you and those you love and pray for today. And until I see you again, virtually or face-to-face, -face, God be with you.